Chapter 1. What's a boundary anyway? The issues are different for many couples, but the perplexity is often the same. One spouse feels something is missing, but she can't figure out what it is. She tries to do the right things. She gives, sacrifices, honors the commitment, and believes the best. And yet she doesn't achieve intimacy. Or worse than that, she doesn't avoid pain. In some cases, the confusion hides itself behind the simplistic explanations that problems, such as addiction, irresponsibility, control, or abuse, provide. Oh, if he were just not so controlling, or if she would just stop spending. Partners think that they can explain why their relationship lacks intimacy by the presence of, quote, the problem. They are surprised to find that even when the, quote, problem goes away, the person with whom they can't connect or find love remains. In other cases, there may be no problems, but the marriage does not live up to the promise that one or both of the partners had in the beginning. Commitment may be strong, but love, intimacy, and deep sharing are not present. Why does this happen with two people who are so committed to the relationship? In our work with couples over the years, we have observed that while many dynamics go into producing and maintaining love, over and over again, one issue is at the top of the list, boundaries. When boundaries are not established in the beginning of a marriage, or they break down, marriages break down as well. Or, such marriages don't grow past the initial attraction and transform themselves into real intimacy. They never reach the true knowing of each other, and the ongoing ability to abide in love and to grow as individuals and as a couple, the long-term fulfillment that was God's design. For this intimacy to develop and grow, there must be boundaries. So, with that in mind, we're going to take a big-picture look at what boundaries are. We will give an introductory course for those of you who have never read our book, Boundaries, and a refresher course for those of you who have. What is a boundary? Well, in the simplest sense, a boundary is a property line. It denotes the beginning and end of something. In relationships, ownership is also very important. If I know where boundaries are in our relationship, I know who owns things, such as feelings, attitudes, and behaviors as well. I know whom they belong to. And if there is a problem with one of those, I know to whom the problem belongs as well. A relationship like marriage requires each partner to have a sense of ownership of himself or herself. The first way in which clarifying boundaries helps us is to know where one person ends and the other begins. What is the problem and where is it? Is it in you or is it in me? Well, once we know the boundaries, we know who should be owning whichever problem we are wrestling with. This issue of ownership is vital to any relationship, especially marriage. Boundaries help us to determine who is responsible for what. If we understand who owns what, then we know who must take responsibility for it. If we can discover who is responsible for what, we have an opportunity for change. If we can see that the problem is our problem and that we are responsible for the problem, then we are in the driver's seat of change. For the first time, we are empowered. Responsibility also involves action. If something is going to happen, it's going to happen because we take action. We need to change some attitudes or behaviors or reactions or choices. We must actively participate in the resolution of whatever relational problem we might have, even if it's not our fault. Each spouse must take responsibility for the following things. Feelings, attitudes, behaviors, choices, limits, Desires, thoughts, values, talents, and love. Responsibility tells us that we are the ones who must work through our feelings and learn how to feel differently. Our attitudes, not those of our spouse, cause us to feel distressed and powerless. How we behave and react is part of the problem, and we have to change these patterns. We allow ourselves to get pushed beyond certain limits and then become resentful or powerless. We do not turn desires into accomplished goals, or we do not deal with our sick desires. Responsibility empowers us to have a good life. We are not at the mercy of our spouse's behavior or problems. Each spouse can act both to avoid being a victim of the other spouse's problems and, better yet, to change the marriage relationship itself. Later, we will show you how to change your marriage for the better, even if your spouse is not interested in changing. 
But the process always begins with taking responsibility for your own part in the problem. Boundaries help us to realize our freedom once again. When someone realizes the freedom he or she has from a spouse or anyone else, many options open up. Boundaries help us to know just where someone's control begins and ends. As with the property lines above, so it is with relationships. Just as your next-door neighbor can't force you to paint your house purple, neither can any other human being make you do anything. It violates the basic law of freedom God established in the universe. For love to work, each spouse has to realize his or her own freedom. And boundaries help us define the freedom we have and the freedom we do not have. Marriage is not slavery. It is based on a love relationship, which is deeply rooted in freedom. Each partner is free from the other and therefore free to love the other. Where there is control or perception of control, there is not love. Love only exists where there is freedom. Three realities have existed since the beginning of time, freedom, responsibility, and love. God created us free. He gave us responsibility for our freedom. And as responsible free agents, we are told to love Him and each other. This emphasis runs throughout the entire Bible. When we do these three things, live free, take responsibility for our own freedom and how we use it, and then thirdly, love Him and each other, then life, including marriage, can be an Eden experience. Something incredible happens as these three ingredients of relationship work together. As love grows, spouses become more free from the things that enslave, self-centeredness, sinful patterns, past hurts, and other self-imposed limitations. Then, they gain a greater and greater sense of self-control and responsibility. As they act more responsible, they become more loving, and then the cycle begins all over again. As love grows, so does freedom leading to more responsibility and to more love. Remember, where there is no freedom, there is slavery. And where there is slavery, there will be rebellion. Also, where there is no responsibility, there is bondage. Where we do not take ownership and do what we are supposed to do with our own stuff, we will be stuck at certain levels of relationship, and we will not be able to go deeper. The last aspect of boundaries that makes love grow is protection. Think of your house for a moment. You probably have some protection around your property somewhere, but your locked gate or door is not a wall either. You need to be able to open the gate or door when you want to invite the good guys onto your property or into the house. In other words, boundaries need to not only protect, but also be permeable. They need to keep the bad out and allow the good in. As it is with your house, so it is with your soul. You need protective boundaries that you can put up when evil is present and you can let down when the danger is over. However, when you build a fence around your yard, you do not build it to figure out the boundaries of your neighbor's yard so that you can dictate to him how he is to behave. You build it around your own yard so that you can maintain control of what happens to your own property. Well, personal boundaries do the same. If someone trespasses your personal boundaries in some way, you can take control of yourself and not allow yourself to be controlled or hurt anymore. This is the essence of self-control. And ultimately, self-control serves love, not selfishness. We hope that when you take control of yourself, you will love better and more purposefully and intentionally so that you and your spouse can have the intimacy you desire. However, boundaries are only built and established in the context of relationship. To run from a relationship as the first step of boundaries is not to have boundaries at all. It is a defense against developing boundaries with another person. The only place boundaries are real is within the relationship itself. This is what we would like for you and your spouse. In this tape, we will help you to get better defined, more free and responsible, and more in position to love and be loved. This is the high calling God created marriage to be. Chapter 2, Applying the Ten Laws of Boundaries to Marriage. When we speak at seminars on boundary issues, the most often asked questions go something like this. How do I handle my husband's lack of intimacy? Or, what should I say to my wife when she overspends? Many couples struggle with these important issues. However, we find it difficult to answer these questions because we don't know each couple's particular situation. A husband who isn't intimate may be distant because he has trust issues. Or he may be self-absorbed. Or he may be normal, and his wife may have unrealistic expectations. A wife who overspends may have problems structuring herself. 
or she may be in denial of the financial problem, or she may have a controlling husband. Boundary issues in marriage always require an understanding of the situation. For us to say, well, tell your husband or wife this or this, without having a grasp of the marriage may sound helpful, but it could also prove to be pretty useless advice. Though we give practical suggestions throughout the book and this tape, in the long run, learning principles helps more than learning techniques. We have, therefore, included this section on the laws of boundaries, not as practical strategies, but as principles by which to structure your own marriage. These laws, which we've also explained in Boundaries and Boundaries with Kids, take you beyond the problem-solving level of boundaries. They'll help you understand how boundaries work, and they may be able to help you solve problems before they start. These laws of boundaries are not about marriage as it should be. They are about marriage as it really is. As with the laws of science, such as the law of gravity and the law of electromagnetism, the laws of boundaries are always in force, whether or not we are aware of them. The laws of boundaries lay the foundation of how responsibility works in life. You may read them and think, so that's why we've struggled in our marriage. Or you may think, so that's why this part of our relationship works pretty well. Either way, you will benefit by becoming familiar with these ten laws. Law number one, the law of sowing and reaping. Simply put, this principle means that our actions have consequences. When we do loving, responsible things, people draw close to us. When we're unloving or irresponsible, people withdraw from us. As the Bible teaches in the sixth chapter of Galatians, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. When we do loving, responsible things, people draw close to us. When we are unloving or irresponsible, people withdraw from us. Law number two, the law of responsibility. A proper view of responsibility is necessary to set limits in marriage. On the one hand, when you marry, you take on the burden of loving your spouse deeply and caring for him or her as for no other. You care about how you affect your spouse. You care about your spouse's welfare and feelings. If one spouse feels no sense of responsibility to the other, this spouse is, in effect, trying to live married life as a single person. On the other hand, you can't cross the line of responsibility. You need to avoid taking ownership for your mate's life. The law of responsibility is this. We are responsible to each other, but not for each other. Law number three, the law of power. If any law fetches more questions than any other, the law of power is probably the one. The law of power clarifies what we do and don't have power over. First, let's talk about what we don't have power over. We have no power over the attitudes and actions of other people. We can't make our spouse grow up. We can't stop our spouse from exhibiting a troublesome habit or character flaw. We don't have the power to make our spouse into the person we would like him or her to be, but we don't have the power to be the person we would like to be either. In and of ourselves, we are powerless to change such things as our short temper or our eating problem. To some extent, we all do what we hate to do. It's helpful to be aware of this powerlessness in our marriage so we can be more understanding of our spouse's struggle. Also, being aware of our powerlessness over ourselves can help us realize how long it may take to learn to set appropriate limits in our marriage. If you don't have power to change your spouse, then what do you have power over? You have the power to confess, submit, and repent of your own hurtful ways in your marriage. You can identify these hurtful ways and ask God for His help to overcome them and be willing to change. Whatever your spouse does that bothers you, it's certain that you do things that bother him also. If you want your spouse to listen to your boundaries, ask him where you may be violating his. When you're hurt or upset, you may try to control everything or you may withdraw in a silence. Nothing is more conducive to a spouse's growth than a mate who sincerely wants to change. Law number four, the law of respect. Some people think the law of respect is the bad guy of the ten though it is actually very freeing. The law of respect states that if we wish for others to respect our boundaries, we need to respect theirs. There is no such thing as a free lunch. 
We can't expect others to cherish our limits if we don't cherish theirs. Law number five, the law of motivation. The law of motivation states that we must be free to say no before we can wholeheartedly say yes. No one can actually love another if he feels he doesn't have a choice not to. Giving your time, your love, or your vulnerability to your spouse requires that you make your own choice based on your values, not out of fear. Having to do anything is a sign that someone's afraid, and fear always works against love. Conversely, love drives out fear. When we are freely choosing to love, we are no longer driven by fears. We are driven by affection. Law number six, the law of evaluation. This is the essence of the law of evaluation. We need to evaluate the pain our boundaries cause others. Do they cause pain that leads to injury? Or do they cause pain that leads to growth? You see, it's unloving to set limits with a spouse to harm him. This is revenge which is in God's hands and not ours. But it can be just as unloving to avoid setting a limit with your spouse because you don't want him to be uncomfortable. Sometimes discomfort is a great opportunity for growth. You may need to confront your spouse or give him a warning or set a consequence. Do not neglect setting limits in your marriage because of a fear of causing pain. Pain can be the best friend your relationship has ever had. Law number seven, the law of proactivity. The law of proactivity is taking actions to solve problems based on your values, your wants, and your needs. Proactive people solve problems without having to blow up. They are their boundaries, so they don't have to do a boundary as often as reactive folks do. Law number eight, the law of envy. The most powerful obstacle to setting boundaries in marriage is envy. Envy is devaluing what we have, thinking it's not enough. We then focus on what others have, all the while resenting them for having good things that we don't possess. Envy is miserable because we're dissatisfied with our state, yet powerless to change it. Envy is different from desire. Desire involves wanting something, and it motivates us to take action to possess it. God wants to give us our desires. Desire doesn't focus on our emptiness, nor how lucky others seem to be. Desire preserves the goodness and value of what we have and of those we are in relationship with. But envy causes lots of boundary problems in marriage. You can't set limits in marriage until you are looking at yourself as part of the problem and as a great deal of the solution. Work through envy, own your problems, and take action. Law number nine, the law of activity. The law of activity states that we need to be active in learning and setting boundaries. Have you ever noticed how some couples are divided into the active spouse and the passive one? One spouse takes more initiative, sets goals, and confronts problems. The other waits for his spouse to make a move first, then responds. Well, all things being equal, active spouses have an edge in boundary setting. Taking initiative increases your chances to learn from mistakes. Active people make lots of mistakes, and wise ones grow from them. They try something, they experience a limit, they adapt. They experience the depth of God's forgiveness because they do things for which they need to be forgiven. Passive people have trouble learning because they're afraid to take risks. Because of this, they also have a harder time taking charge of their own lives and boundaries. Law number 10, the law of exposure. The law of exposure states that we need to communicate our boundaries to each other. God designed boundaries to promote love and truth. Spouses need to make clear what they do or don't want. They need to work on understanding what their spouse is saying about their boundaries. When boundaries are exposed, two souls can be connected in the marriage. But when boundaries are unexposed, spouses are less emotionally present in the marriage and love struggles. When we expose our boundaries to the light of relationship, we can be fully connected to our spouse. We can resolve problems. We can take a stand to actively love our spouse by risking conflict for the sake of the relationship. Exposure is the only way for healing and growth to take place. Apply these laws to your marriage and see how they change the way you relate to each other. Remember, you can't break laws forever without consequences. We all have to either live in accord with them and succeed or continually defy them 
and pay the consequences. These laws will help your marriage adapt to God's principles of relationship. Chapter 3, Setting Boundaries with Yourself, Becoming More Lovable. Nobody wants to hear what we're about to say. We all want to find ways to say no to our spouses rather than ourselves. Yet the ideas in this chapter may be the only hope for your marriage to develop a healthy set of boundaries. Boundaries in marriage is not the same as boundaries on your spouse. This isn't about changing or fixing or making your spouse do anything. It's about bringing boundaries into the relationship to provide a context in which both mates can grow. Thus, more often than not, the first boundaries we set in marriage are with ourselves. We deny ourselves certain freedoms to say or do whatever we'd like in order to achieve a higher purpose. We learn to restrict ourselves from confronting someone when that has proven futile. Many spouses use the concept of boundaries to go on the hunt to make their mate change his ways. Instead of a marriage problem, they see a spouse problem. Now, we aren't denying a spouse's responsibility for problems. However, blaming one's spouse oversimplifies the issue and often doesn't solve the problem. The reality of boundaries in marriage is that no matter what the issue in your marriage, you need to take the initiative to solve it. For example, you may have a spouse who is chronically late or is fiscally irresponsible or withdraws and avoids relationship or becomes angry or attempts to control you. Though you may share no blame in creating these problems, you probably need to take some initiative in solving them. Now, this often feels unfair to people. They'll say, why should I have to solve a problem that I didn't cause? This is a legitimate question. However, the question exposes a demand for fairness that will never exist in a fallen world. Such a question keeps people protesting and complaining while still mired in the problem. God sees it another way. He says that no matter who causes a problem, we are to take steps to solve it. If our brother has something against us, we are to go to him. At the same time, if our brother sins against us, we are to go to him fault is irrelevant. We need to work to resolve the problem, and God works this way also. He saw our lost state and the problems we had caused ourselves and took the first step of sending his son to die to reconcile a problem that was never his anyway. As the song goes, we owed a debt we could not pay. He paid a debt that he did not owe. Another reason we need to look first at our own boundaries on ourselves is that more often than not, we aren't blameless. Typically, spouses are performing a dance they don't even talk about, but the dance perpetuates the problem and generally involves a payoff for the innocent spouse. An important aspect of setting boundaries with ourselves is that of taking ownership of our lives. We need to take responsibility for our hearts, our loves, our time, and our talents. We are to own our lives and live in God's light, growing up and maturing our character along the way. This is our job and no one else's. However, this is not as easy as it sounds. We are more concerned about the person who is making us crazy or miserable than we are about the state of our very souls. Blaming someone else shifts the light of truth from us to someone else. Well, we come by this trait honestly. Adam and Eve both blame someone else for their own failings. When we neglect setting boundaries with ourselves and focus instead on setting boundaries with those we think sorely need limits, we have limited our own spiritual growth. And as in any growth process, spiritual growth proceeds to the level that we invest in it. When we only invest in changing someone else, they get the benefits of our efforts, but the important work that we have to do has been neglected. For example, you may have the following reactions to your spouse. Withdrawal from his anger. Resentment at his irresponsibility. Letting go of your responsibilities due to his inattention. Becoming self-centered out of his self-centeredness. Let's assume your spouse is all of the above, angry and irresponsible, inattentive and self-centered. You will not grow if you continue to react to his sins. We must be more deeply concerned about our own issues than our spouse's. We really can't overstate the importance of this idea. One of the most frightening facts in existence is that God will someday call us to account for our lives here on earth. At that meeting, 
we will not be able to blame or hide behind or deflect to the sins and problems of our spouse. It will end up being a one-on-one conversation with God. Boundaries with yourself are a much bigger issue than boundaries in your marriage. In the end, while we are only partly responsible for growing our marriages, we are completely responsible to God for developing our souls. You are responsible for half your marriage and all of your soul. Boundaries on yourself are between you and God. Another aspect of setting limits with ourselves in marriage is the difficulty that comes with being the quote, good, unquote, spouse. In many marriages, one mate is more obviously selfish, irresponsible, withdrawn, or controlling. The other is perceived as a suffering saint, and people wonder how he tolerates the pain of living with such a problem person. This often makes it hard for the good spouse to set appropriate boundaries for himself. Well, there are a number of reasons for this. First, the suffering spouse may focus more on his spouse's problems than his own. The more apparent the flaws, the more friends will talk about the flaws of the spouse rather than the problems of the sufferer. A friend of mine was devastated when his wife left him, and it took him years to finally see how his own people-pleasing behavior led to her leaving. All of his friends helped to keep him away from this awareness by constantly criticizing the abandoning spouse. They would tell him how selfish she was to leave a loving, nice person like you. What they would not tell him, and what he needed to hear also, was she was selfish, but you were indirect and passive, and you withheld your feelings from her. Secondly, the good spouse often feels helpless in the relationship. He's tried to love better and more, and yet the problem continues. Because being good generally means being caring and compassionate, he doesn't have access to other helpful tools, such as truthfulness, honesty, limits, and consequences. And thirdly, the good spouse can easily take a morally superior position toward his spouse. Since his contributions to the problem may not be as obvious, he may think, I'm not capable of being as destructive as my mate. This is a dangerous position to take. We are all capable of just about anything due to our sinful nature. Anytime we focus on our goodness, we turn our hearts away from our own need for love and forgiveness. We need to realize our need for limits because we need to submit ourselves to the same rules that we want our partner to submit to. Submitting to the boundary process is the great equalizer in marriage and keeps both spouses in a mutual relationship instead of a one-up or a one-down one. Both need to accept and respect the limits of the other. No one plays God, doing what he wants and expecting the other to comply. When one mate protests her spouse's disorganization, yet will not look at her own controlling tendencies, she stands little chance of seeing him change. Sooner or later, the hypocrisy of that parental position will break down any good influence on the other spouse. When you set limits on yourself, you create an environment in which your spouse can become free to choose and grow. It is tempting to try to change your spouse. Controlling and nagging, complying and blaming, they are all futile in helping your spouse to grow. Your spouse will only react to your control. He won't experience his need for love or his loneliness or his gratitude or his healthy guilt or the consequences of his actions. He will be more concerned with staying free of your attempts to change him or even with retaliating to show you how it feels to be him. You cannot make your spouse grow up. That is between him and God. But you can make it easier for him to experience the love and the limits that he needs. When he faces the consequences of his immaturity, he stands a better chance of changing than if he faces your nagging and hounding. Become truthful, not controlling. In the next part of the tape, we'll show you how important it is for you to be a separate person from your spouse. Ironically, becoming an individual is the key to becoming one with your mate. Chapter 4. It Takes Two to Make One Oneness. It's the word that romance is made of. It's the word couples dream about when they first meet. Listen to a friend's description when she feels that she has finally found, quote, the one. Watch an old movie, and you'll see the leading man and the leading lady gazing into each other's eyes with the fantasy of total oneness. 
In reality, this oneness is not a fantasy at all. It's God's very design for marriage. It's the Bible's description of marriage. From the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God decided that it was, quote, not good for the man to be alone, and he put man and woman together to establish this oneness everyone seeks. As Jesus told us, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. So the movies are right after all. Oneness is real life. What the movies don't show, however, is what it takes to get there. Most people have felt the initial fantasy of oneness. In the first stage of falling in love, a couple gives up all internal boundaries and feels a euphoric sense of merger with each other. This initial stage of a relationship can be wonderful as couples experience the state of oneness for which they have longed. But these experiences are not real oneness. They're only a fantasy. They are only a preview. Oneness is built over time as a relationship grows and as the, quote, two become one. The movies don't show us this part, the part where the initial euphoria goes away, the oneness disappears, and the couple becomes disillusioned. They wonder, what went wrong? Did I marry the wrong person? At this point, many give up in part ways. They think that they can, quote, do better with someone else, not knowing that the remedy probably lies in their own growth, not in finding a new person. A new relationship will require the same growing pains, both as an individual and as a couple, that they are avoiding going through now. Let's examine how every married couple needs to grow. Let's look first at the prerequisite of the, quote, two becoming one. This prerequisite is that for two to become one, we must have two at the outset. Two complete individuals. What does this mean? And what does this have to do with boundaries? The requirement for oneness is two complete people. If two people who marry are complete, the oneness they establish will be complete. To the degree that either is less than complete as a person, the oneness will suffer under the strain of that incompleteness. The incomplete partner's longing for completeness will take precedent over what he is able to give to the relationship, and the relationship will suffer. So, if one or both are coming to the marriage asking the marriage to complete them as people, the marriage will break down. Marriage is not meant to be the place where one gets completed as a person. It is meant for complete persons to come together and to build a we that is bigger and better than either one of the, quote, eyes involved. But marriage is an adult contract, and you should not attempt it without two adults present. For a marriage to work, two separate individuals need to have some elements of adulthood. No one has ever made it to adulthood ready for all that it requires. The good news is that you can grow towards this adulthood or completeness, and as you do, your relationship will attain more and more oneness as well. Before we take a look at the requirements of this adulthood, I'd like to make one more important point about two becoming one. As we said above, marriage was not designed to complete a person. It was designed for two complete people to enter into and form something different than either of them is on their own. It was designed not to make you a whole person, but to give your wholeness a new range of experience. But many people see marriage as a ticket to shortcut completeness or maturity. Therefore, they don't marry out of strength, but out of weakness. They marry someone to make up for what they do not possess on their own. They marry out of their incompleteness, and doing so erodes the possibility for oneness. This point is so important that I'm going to say it again. The crucial element of two becoming one is that the two people must be complete in and of themselves. They must be adults before they marry. This does not mean that the husband and wife possess all of the talents and abilities the other one possesses, or even the same style. It does mean, however, that they possess all of adult functioning in key areas of personhood. There's no shortcut to growth. You cannot skip out on maturity by, quote, marrying into it. You must become a complete individual on your own in order to have true oneness with your spouse. But how can you go about becoming a complete, mature, and whole person? What exactly are the requirements of adulthood? Well, the first requirement of adults, or completed persons, is that they take responsibility for all of the treasures of their own souls. If they don't, their marriage will stagnate to the degree that they disown aspects of their lives and then either blame the other or require the other to fix it or make up for it. Remember the term codependency? It was a buzzword of the 1980s. 
Basically, codependency is taking responsibility for another person's problems and not requiring that person to take responsibility for his own. Why do we mention it here in a section on becoming a complete person? Because a mature, complete adult not only takes responsibility for himself, but also requires the same from the people he loves. To be codependent and not require responsibility from others is to not be responsible oneself. The first component is the ability to see your spouse as a separate person, distinct from you, with her own needs and feelings. In other words, she doesn't exist just to meet your needs. A very young child feels this way towards his mother. He feels that his every wish should be her command. It never occurs to him that she might have a life apart from him or feelings apart from what he needs at the moment. This mindset is acceptable in an infant or toddler, but in an adult spouse, it can be a relationship wrecker. Whenever we view others only in terms of how they affect us, we are in big trouble. The second way in which we allow others to exist in their own right is to allow their experience. We need to put our own experience aside and join in the other's experience at times. We need to understand the other's experience, identify with it, and have compassion for the other person in it. The ability to do this is called empathy. Empathy is a bedrock of intimacy. The third way in which we allow others to exist in their own right is allowing them the freedom to be different from us. What do a couple do when they differ? Well, it all depends on how separate they are. Whether or not they can get to oneness will depend on how okay it is to have two opinions, two moods, two tastes, or two needs in the relationship at one time. In a good marriage, spouses value each other's differences, and they treat them with respect. In a marriage in which the individuals aren't allowed to be different, things don't go as well. Another part of the, quote, you are not me concept is the ability to see another person for who she is apart from what we want or need from her and to love and appreciate that person for who she is. To cherish another's existence apart from you and what you get from that person is a neat aspect of love. It requires very good boundaries, the ability to see the other person as distinct and separate from you, a person in her own right, with value and wonderful things about her that have nothing to do with gratifying you in any way other than just pure appreciation. This is the joy of just knowing and appreciating another person. This neat aspect of love is one of the ones that gives the most pleasure as couples grow together. A good marriage among two complete people is one in which they keep their individuality in space, and this actually serves to strengthen their relationship. After they have been apart, they come together and share each partner's experience. Relishing these experiences with each other adds to the intimacy. The problem marriage is one in which one partner sees time apart, separateness, and space as a threat. But freedom is the scariest of all human privileges. The call to relationship with God and each other is a call to freedom. But that freedom is not to be used to gratify self-centeredness or selfishness. Remember, it goes both ways. You are not only free to be separate, but you are also free to be controlling. No one can stop you except yourself. So if you're trying to control your spouse's separateness and freedom with guilt and prohibition, then ask yourself the same question. Would you like to be imprisoned? Again, the answer is certainly not. The golden rule is the best defense against freedom becoming a license to be self-centered. God designed human beings with a longing for relationship, with a longing to come together and not go through life alone. Single people also have this longing to belong, a need that can be filled by friends and relatives in the church and community. God designed marriage particularly to satisfy this longing for deeper relationship in a special way, to give companionship on life's journey. This drive for companionship must be kept at the forefront of our discussion of freedom. If one of you is controlling, if you restrict your partner's freedom, companionship is destroyed. But beyond that, freedom nourishes separateness, which is in and of itself an undesirable state. Therefore, freedom from each other ironically creates the very longing that will bring you together over and over again. You give more freedom, you get more intimacy. 
You must build freedom into your marriage so that you have enough separateness to desire to come together to solve the problem that that very freedom and separateness creates. This paradox is one of the balancing truths in God's universe. Separateness and togetherness go hand in hand. If you have too much separateness, you have no relationship because you become too disconnected. But if you have no separateness, you also have no relationship because there are no longer two people involved. Therefore, see the need for freedom as part of God's design and find the right balance between togetherness and freedom for the two of you. Make sure you have both. If you give freedom, you will have longing. If you have togetherness, you will create more love that gives rise to more freedom to express who you are becoming with the other. Friends, hobbies, work, time apart are all part of the mix. Nurture them and they will come back to you many times over. Chapter 5, Building Boundaries in Marriage What you value is what you'll have. I don't remember where I first heard this saying, but I've come to believe it. You get what you tolerate. In other words, in an imperfect world, imperfection will always seek you out. And if you tolerate it, you will certainly find all of it that you can handle. Unpleasant things seek the level they are allowed to exist in your life, especially in marriage. While you might get all the bad stuff you tolerate, what about the good things in a marriage? Where do they come from? Well, they generally come from the same place from which tolerance comes. They come from your values. On both the positive and the negative side, ultimately, what you value is what you will have. If you value something in a relationship, you will not tolerate anything that destroys this value. And you will also seek to make sure it is present in building. And because of these values, the relationship takes on an identity and form, a character of its own. Certain things happen in the relationship and other things don't. What you value happens and what you don't value will be absent. In marriage, for example, it works like this. We will not tolerate anything that violates our value of honesty. And secondly, we both will actively seek to build and increase the presence of honesty in our marriage. The same is true of other values as well. Your values make sure that certain bad things are not present in the marriage and that certain good things are. The values become the ultimate identity and protective boundaries of the marriage. Earlier, we said that a boundary is a property line that defines where something ends and something else begins. Your values are the ultimate boundaries of your marriage. They form it, protect it, and they give it a place to grow. They dictate what the nature of the relationship is going to be, what is not going to be allowed to grow there, as well as what is going to be sought after and maintained. The values of your relationship become like the frame of a house. They give it shape. What you value determines the kind of relationship you most likely will have in the end. For this reason, we want to introduce in this chapter the six values that will give a certain shape and identity to your marriage, some values that will serve to protect it and cause it to grow in the direction God intends and you desire. But before we look at the six important values we want you to lift up, let's first look at the worst value ever. I was talking to a young man one day about his girlfriend. He was thinking about getting married, and he had questions about their relationship. Several times during the conversation, he said that something she did or something about the relationship did not, quote, make him happy. It was clear that this was a theme for him. She was not, quote, making him happy. When I asked, I found that she wanted him to deal with some things in the relationship. He needed to do some work that took effort. It was not a, quote, happy time. When he had to work on the relationship, he no longer liked it. At first, I was trying to understand what the difficulties were, but the more I listened, the more I saw that he was the difficulty. His attitude was, if I'm not happy, something bad must be happening. And his immediate conclusion was always that the, quote, bad was in someone else, not him. From his perspective, he was no part of any problem, much less part of the solution. Finally, I had heard about as much as I could take of his self-centered ramblings. I think I know what you should do, I said. What, he asked. I think you should get a goldfish. Looking at me as if I were a little crazy, he asked, What are you talking about? Why do you say that? Well, it sounds to me like that's about the highest level of relationship you're ready for. Forget the marriage thing. What do you mean by the highest level of relationship, he asked me. Well, even a dog makes demands on you. A dog has to be let out to go to the bathroom. You have to clean up after it. 
Other times it requires time from you when you don't want to give it. A dog might interfere with your happiness. Better get a goldfish. A goldfish doesn't ask for much. But a woman, now that's completely out of the question. Now we had something to talk about. This person's greatest value was his own happiness and his own immediate comfort. And I can't think of a worse value in life, especially a life that includes marriage. Why? Is this a killjoy attitude? Hardly. I'm not advocating misery. I hate pain. But I do know this. People who always want to be happy and pursue it above all else are some of the most miserable people in the world. The reason is that happiness is a result. It is sometimes the result of having good things happen, but usually it is the result of our being in a good place inside ourselves. It is the result of our having done the character work we need to do so that we are content and joyful in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. Happiness is a fruit of a lot of hard work in relationships, career, spiritual growth, or a host of other arenas in life. But nowhere is this as true as in marriage. Marriage is a lot of work, period. I don't know anyone who's been married very long who does not attest to that. When couples do the right kind of work, character work, they find that they gain more happiness in their marriage than they thought possible. But it always comes as a result of going through some difficult moments or times. Conflicts, hurt feelings, fears, old traumas, big and small rejections, arguments, and hurt feelings, the disillusionment of someone being different than was imagined, the difficult task of accepting imperfections and immaturity that are larger than one thinks they should be. All of these things are normal, and all of these things are workable, and if people work through them, they reach happiness again. But usually this time it's a happiness of a deeper and better sort, one that won't go away with circumstance. But if they hit these inevitable walls and have the attitude that this problem is, quote, interfering with my happiness, they are in real trouble. They will be angry with the, quote, inconvenience of their happiness being interrupted and will refuse to solve the issues or will just leave the relationship. If happiness is our guide and it goes away momentarily, we will assume that something is wrong when something may be very normal. The truth is, and this is why happiness is such a horrible value, is that when we are not happy, something good may be happening. You may have been brought to that moment of crisis because of a need for growth in your life. And this crisis may be the solution to much of what is wrong with the rest of your life as well. If you could grasp whatever it is that this situation is asking you to learn, it just could change your entire life. An analogy might be someone who drives a car and runs into a tree a few times. Nothing life-threatening happens, but it does cause trouble. He goes out again and hits a few more trees. Finally, he says, Enough of this! And he sells the car. I hate this car. It just keeps running into trees. And he thinks that he will just go out and get a new one and be happy. He never understands the part that he played in the scenario. He thinks that a new car will solve his problem because this one is not making him happy. But if he were to work on his driving, he could graduate from hitting trees and arrive at a place where he no longer has this kind of wreck. And then he would find the happiness of tree-free driving. He would finally be a complete driver, in James' terms. The happiness would be a result of doing the hard work and getting past the issue causing him pain. But if happiness were his biggest value, then working on driving, well, that just might interfere with his happiness. Many things are better to worry about than happiness, and these are the things that ultimately will produce the happiness you're looking for. Be willing to do the hard work of growth now, no matter how it feels, and the happiness will likely find you. Don't have the worst value ever. I must be happy at all times, and I value that more than anything else, even more than growth. If you do that, happiness certainly will elude you. If not happiness, then what should you value? What should you magnify and lift up to guide you? Certainly, we cannot decide all of your values for you. But a few values the Bible holds in very high esteem. And these values work to produce great boundaries in marriage. Below is a list of these six values. In the next part of the tape, we will take a closer look at why each can help you build a marriage that lasts. Number one, love of God. 
Number two, love of your spouse. Number three, honesty. Number four, faithfulness. Number five, compassion and forgiveness. And number six, holiness. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those who focus on what they want, always desiring it and never attaining it, and those who focus on what it takes to obtain what they want. The latter do the work. They delay gratification. They sacrifice and ultimately get the rewards of their work. In marriage, if you focus on what you want and desire and just stay angry and disappointed that you are not getting it, you will remain there. But if you focus on cultivating the garden instead of demanding the fruit, then your garden will yield a huge harvest. So it is with values. Make cultivating the ones we mention here of prime concern. Work on them. Stand against anything in yourself or your spouse that would destroy them. This is righteous indignation, and your marriage may depend on it. But also, do everything you can to increase the presence of these things. Give time, money, energy, focus, and other resources to developing the love of God in each other. Honesty, faithfulness, tenderheartedness, and holiness. Pursue them with everything the two of you can muster. They will not fail you in the end. Chapter 6, Eternal Values. Value 1, Love of God. I was meeting with a couple once who had given up hope in their relationship. I knew that they were at the end of themselves. From their perspective, divorce was the next option. At the same time, I knew that their problems were very curable. They were suffering from many of the issues we discussed in Chapter 4 on the theme that it takes two to become one. I felt that we first needed to put this couple's hopelessness squarely on the table. Do either of you have any hope for this marriage, I asked. No, we don't, they both finally admitted. Then I said something that threw them. Good, now we can get to work. What do you mean, they asked, surprised. What they did not know was that I knew they both had a deep love for God. And although they were ready and willing to forsake each other, they were not ready to forsake him. I trusted their faith in God. I knew that if they could stop lying to themselves about wanting to change, quote, for the other person, we could get to someone for whom they would change, and that was God. So I told them so. I think that both of you are so disappointed in each other and in your relationship that you have very little hope of solving your problems for each other. In reality, there's not enough love between the two of you to hold you together. I'm glad that you are facing that reality because deep down, you both know it. But I know something else about you. You both love God enough to make the changes that he wants you to make. And if you do that, I promise you that you will do very well in your relationship. Will you both commit to that kind of love? Can you both commit to doing what God is going to ask of you in this process? Both said that they could but both were downhearted about it. They thought that I meant that just because God says he is against divorce, I was just asking them to remain faithful to him and just stick it out in a miserable relationship. Well, in a sense, I was. But I knew better than that. I knew that if they could submit to the changes God would ask them to make, the marriage would get better. But since they could not believe that, they just had to take it on faith. Jesus, in the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, said that the greatest commandment is to love God with every ounce of you, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, with all of your strength. Why did he place this value above all the others? Although we could point to many reasons, one in particular relates to marriage. When loving God is our orienting principle in life, we are always adjusting to what he requires from us. When things get tough in a marriage, and when some change is required from us, we might not want to do it. We might feel that it is unfair that we have to change, or it might just be too difficult or painful to change. But if we know that it's God with whom we ultimately have to deal, we submit to this reality and his higher calling to us to grow. In the end, the relationship wins. Loving God must be first. He empowers us to change. He tells us how to change. And most of all, God becomes the one that keeps us from being ultimately in charge. 
If we try to be in charge, we will do it our way, and then our own limitations become the limitations of the relationship as well. We all need someone bigger to answer to, so we will make the changes we need to make. Love God first with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Lose your life to Him, and you will gain it. And the couple who'd given up, it took a lot of time and a lot of hard work, but they're still together and happier than they ever dreamed possible. Value number two, love of your spouse. You know, we hear a lot about love. We all have our own ideas about what love means. To some, it is romance. To others, it is security. Some are attracted to power and achievement. We all say, I love that about you. What we mean when we say this is that there is something in the other person that gratifies us in some way, and we like it. These are all wonderful aspects of loving another person. We celebrate who that person is. He or she adds to our existence. Love is a part of the relationship. But what happens when we don't see what we love about our spouse? What happens when that kind of love disappears? The love that builds a marriage is not that kind of love. It's the kind of love that God has for us. It's called agape. Agape is love that seeks the welfare of the other person. It is love that has nothing to do with how someone is gratifying us or making us happy at the moment. It has to do with what is good for the other. In short, agape is concerned with the best for the other person. Jesus said it this way in the second greatest commandment, Love your neighbor as yourself. When we do that, we are truly loving someone. What does it mean to love someone as yourself in marriage? First, you so deeply identify with your spouse that you feel the effects of your own behavior on your spouse. When people do things in marriage that hurt the relationship, selfishness, and a lack of thinking about how that selfishness will affect the other person is usually at the root. Scott became angry with Maria in our session. When he was threatened, he would become heated and aggressive in communicating with her. And when he became angry with Maria, she would blame him for something. But behind her blame, I saw something she was not showing. I stopped him in the middle of this tirade and turned to her. What are you feeling? I asked. I hate it when he gets like that, she said. No, what are you feeling? I pressed. Maria broke down and cried. Then she told me how scared of him she becomes when he's angry. She sobbed, shaking with fear. I looked at him and saw something I had never seen in him before. He was softening towards her. Tears were in his eyes. He was feeling the damage that he was doing to her. He was, quote, identifying with her. In Jesus' words, he was seeing her as if she were he. Would you like it if you felt that way? I asked him. He looked at her in shame and empathy. I never knew. I'm sorry. Perhaps for the first time in their marriage, he looked past his own behavior to the effects of his behavior. He was seeing what it was like to be on the other end of a relationship with him. He was seeing life through her eyes and her experience. He was seeing her, quote, as if she were he. Would he like to be treated that way? Well, certainly not. And when he began to focus on how he would feel if he were on the receiving end of his actions, he changed his behavior. Second, loving your spouse as yourself means you think of making your spouse's life better. You think first about what it would be like to be in the situation or state of life that she or he is in. Then what would you like if you were in this situation? If you've been working hard all day with a bunch of kids, what would you like from your partner? How about some relief? Wouldn't that feel good? What about other big issues in life? How would you feel if you did not get an opportunity to develop yourself and your talents? You would feel stagnant and stale. You would want an opportunity to grow and develop. You would want someone to give you the freedom and the resources to do that too. Think of the marital arguments this kind of orientation would instantly stop. When one partner wants to take some money from the budget to invest in personal growth, it becomes a team effort because both people feel the effect of that person's need. You feel the other person's need is your own. That's empathy. And you sacrifice to meet it. You also find joy in the happiness and fulfillment that she finds. Third, and this is the most difficult to grasp, 
Loving your spouse as yourself means that you want the best for your spouse, even when your spouse can't see what that is. It may be a difficult confrontation that needs to happen, or a healing in your spouse's life. It may be a need for spiritual growth, or it may be something practical, like being relieved of some duties. But whatever it is, it is for her or him, and not for you. We usually think that someone needs to change in some way, because it will be good for us if she does. This kind of love may cost you. It may put you out. It may be difficult for you. But if you were the other, it would be good. And to love her as yourself means that you want it for your spouse as desperately as you would want it for yourself. In addition to being based in empathy, this love is based in commitment. Again, this is best seen in the kind of commitment that God has for us. God's word for this kind of commitment is covenant. God promises that he is committed to us, and he does not break his promise to us. To commit to someone means that you will be there and that you will stay even when things get difficult. Why is this so important? If someone is not committed to a marriage, then when the marriage gets difficult, he's tempted to leave the marriage instead of working through the difficulty. If leaving is an option, why go through the pain of change? Why go through the work? A problem in a relationship is usually a sign that both parties need to grow and change. And without commitment, avoidance is often the easier way out. Some do not leave physically, but they leave emotionally. They forsake the relationship by taking their heart out of it. But as we have seen above, hanging in there and going through the necessary changes often brings great rewards. The problem is that a runner can never see the finish line in the middle of a marathon. And often, only the commitment to finish can keep the runner running the race. Well, in life, commitment provides the time, structure, and security needed for the change to take place. Commitment also provides something else necessary for growth, security. Without the security that commitment provides, partners know at some deep level that if they do not perform up to some expectation, they could be forsaken. This insecurity gives way to a whole host of growth-stopping cancers. Performance anxiety always inhibits real change. Commitment drives the need for growth as well as the security. If you're going to be with someone for the long term, it's best to work things out. Otherwise, you're certain to be miserable. Love is the foundation for marriage. Love for God and love for another person. It expresses itself in seeking the best for the other person, no matter whether they deserve it or not. It places the other person above one's own selfish needs and desires. It sacrifices, gives, and suffers. It weathers hurts and storms for the long-term preservation of the covenant. It preserves itself as if it is fighting for life. And in the end, that is exactly what is happening. For love and life were meant to be partners from the beginning of creation. Make love your highest value in your marriage, and it is likely to return the commitment you make to it. It will pay you back multifold, much more than you ever thought possible. For in the end, love is the strongest power at our disposal. Value 3. Honesty The act of lying is much more damaging than the things that are being lied about. Deception damages a relationship. And the act of lying is much more damaging than the things that are being lied about because lying undermines the knowing of one another and the connection itself. The point at which deception enters is the point at which relatedness ends. As someone once told me about his fiance, I think she has told me everything, and then I find out one more thing that she fudged on. Ultimately, he called off their marriage because his trust had been seriously eroded. Couples deceive each other in many ways. Sometimes spouses lie over small things, such as spending too much. At other times, they lie about serious things, such as affairs. In our way of thinking, anything, large or small, is forgivable and able to be worked through in a relationship, except deception. Deception is the one thing that cannot be worked through because it denies the problem that needs to be worked through. It is the one unforgivable sin of a relationship because it makes forgiveness unattainable. If it were ever repented of, certainly it could be forgiven as well. But as long as someone is in the stance of lying, forgiveness is blocked. We believe in total honesty, 
But honesty must go along with the other values we've discussed. Honesty without love and commitment can wreck a tenuous connection. Honesty without forgiveness can do the same. Honesty without a commitment to holiness does not give the offended spouse a reason for hope that the problem will not reoccur. What are the areas that couples find it difficult to be honest about? Feelings, disappointments, desires, likes and dislikes, hurts, anger and hatred, sex, sins, failure, and needs and vulnerabilities. Intimacy comes from knowing the other person at a deep level. If there are barriers to honesty, knowing is ruled out and the false takes over. Couples often live out years of falsehood trying to protect and save a relationship, all the while destroying any chance of real relationship. We can't stress enough the importance of being able to share with each other your deepest feelings, needs, hurts, desires, failures, or whatever else is in your soul. If you and your spouse feel safe enough in your marriage to be totally vulnerable, if you can remove your fig leaves, then once again your marriage can return to a state of paradise. True intimacy is the closest thing to heaven we can know. Value 4. Faithfulness. Think about these words. Trust, confidence, assuredness, conviction, fidelity, truth, certainty, permanence. Now, put each of these words into the context of a marriage. Trust each other. Have confidence in each other. Be assured of each other's character and dependability. Be convicted of your ability to trust each other. Be certain of each other's fidelity. Be true to one another. Be certain of one another. Be permanent to each other. All of these words hint at what faithfulness is. A faithful spouse is one who can be trusted, depended upon, and believed in, and one in whom you can rest. Our notion of faithfulness in marriage is too often shallow. We generally think of it only in the physical realm. Yet in many marriages, spouses are physically faithful, but not emotionally faithful. They are faithful with their bodies, but not with their hearts. The partners can't depend upon one another in the ways listed above. There is little trust, little certainty, little safety. Especially in religious circles, people think that if they are not sleeping with someone other than their spouse, they are being faithful. But faithfulness means to be trusted in all areas, not just the sexual, trusted in matters of the heart as well as those of the body. Being faithful to your spouse means that you can be dependent upon to do what you have promised, to follow through on what your spouse has entrusted to you. It means that your spouse can be certain that you will deliver on what you have promised. It could mean being sexually faithful, but it could also mean doing chores faithfully. It could mean staying within the monthly budget and coming home when you say you will. It could be relational safety. One of the words the Bible uses for trust means to be so confident that you can be careless. In other words, you don't have to worry. You are so taken care of that you don't have to take care of yourself. You can trust that what was promised will be done. Faithfulness, of course, also means that you will not stray from the one you love. Physical adultery means giving yourself to someone else sexually. But you can commit emotional adultery as well. You can have an affair of the heart. An affair of the heart means taking aspects of yourself and intentionally keeping them away from the marriage. This does not mean that you cannot have deep, sustaining, healing, and supportive emotional relationships with other people. We strongly believe in the power of friends to heal, sustain, and support. Sometimes, in fact, you need others to help you become whole enough to be able to get closer to your spouse. A friend, counselor, support group may help you to feel safer and learn to trust more, and this will carry over into your marriage. What we are talking about here is when you use other things in life, whether or not they be relationships, to avoid your spouse. The crush at work keeps some part of you split from your spouse. A hobby takes more time and energy than your marriage, or an addiction becomes more important than the person to whom you are committed. Many times, one of the partners will justify unfaithfulness by the other's lack of safety. Well, if she hadn't been so critical, I wouldn't have had to turn to someone else for love. Or, a wife who has an affair will say, well, it wouldn't have happened if he had been meeting my needs. Nothing is further from the truth. An act of unfaithfulness is something that one person does, not two. In short, make a commitment to each other that you will not allow anything to come between you. 
You will be trustworthy. You will be dependable. You will be sexually and emotionally faithful. Few things are more devastating in life to all parties concerned than marital unfaithfulness. If an affair seems as if it is worth it, run like the wind and find a trusted friend to talk you back into your senses. If you are close to having an affair, you are close to destroying a lot of people, and you need to be rescued. If you struggle with wanting to take some part of yourself to someone or something other than your spouse, find out why. Your actions may be okay. Your spouse can't identify with all parts of you. Different interests and different aspects of personal identity keep spouses from totally identifying with each other, and that's okay. One person cannot be all that you need in life. Friends can connect with some parts of you better than your spouse. This is okay. What is not okay is using some lust to keep you split and keep you from integrating your heart to your commitment. Duplicity is taking your heart away from your marriage and bringing it somewhere else. This is unfaithfulness in love or in deed. Value 5. Compassion and Forgiveness I was leading a seminar and I asked the audience of married couples to stop for a moment and think of their spouse. I told them to think of all the wonderful things that they love about their spouse and to concentrate on how awesome that person is and how much they love him or her. Think of the wonderful qualities that you admire and attracted you to that person. Let those feelings fill you, I told them. Then, after they were feeling all giddy and in love again, I asked each person to turn to their spouse who was idealizing them at that moment and to repeat after me, Honey, I am a sinner, and I will fail you, and I will hurt you. You could feel the sense of discombobulation in the room. In one moment, they were shaken from the ideal to the real. Some began to laugh as they got it. Some felt even closer to each other. Some looked up confused as if they did not know what to do with my invitation. But that is reality. The person you love the most and have committed your life to is an imperfect being. This person is guaranteed to hurt you and fail you in many ways, some serious and some not. You can expect the failures to come. So the question becomes, what then? What do you do when your spouse fails you in some way or is less than you wish for him to be? What happens when she has a weakness or a failure? What about an inability to do something? What about an unresolved childhood hurt that he might bring to the relationship? Well, other than denial, there are only a couple of options. You can beat him up for his imperfections or you can love him out of them. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, verse 8, Love covers a multitude of sins. Nothing in a relationship has to permanently destroy that relationship if forgiveness is in the picture. No failure is larger than grace. No hurt exists that love cannot heal. But for all of these miracles to take place, there must be compassion and tenderheartedness. But that is not the human way. The human way is to harden our hearts when we are hurt or offended. Hardness of heart is ultimately the true relationship killer, much more than failure. As Jesus said, failure is not the cause of divorce, but hardness of heart. This is why the Bible places such a high value on tenderheartedness. Compassion, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness ensure something very important. These qualities ensure that imperfect people can experience love and relationship for a long time. Clothe yourselves with them. Value 6. Holiness I doubt that Victoria's Secret comes to mind when you think about holiness. Instead, you probably think about something boring and not very romantic. I doubt that holiness sounds like fun. Holiness does sound stiff and boring to most of us, somewhat like some old church experience from childhood. In reality, holiness is very attractive for a marriage. A holy person is someone who is, quote, blameless. The Bible pictures holiness as not just being religious, but being reality-oriented. To be holy means to be pure and blameless and in touch with God's deepest realities of life. If every marriage placed value on holiness, the following would be present. Confession and ownership of problems in each individual. A relentless drive towards growth and development. A giving up of everything that gets in the way of love. A surrendering of everything that gets in the way of truth and a purity of heart where nothing toxic is allowed to grow. This would be a pretty good list of goals for any marriage counselor to have for his clients. If a marriage counselor could get the partners to confess and own their own problems and try to rid themselves of everything that gets in the way of love, 
He would succeed in healing the marriage. How great it would be if every marriage were doing that on its own. In marriage, holiness is anything but boring. Don't get holiness confused with some religious picture. Pursuing holiness means that you and your spouse pursue becoming the kind of people who can produce true love in life. You become whole. You become trustworthy, honest, faithful, and loving. In marriage, holiness is anything but boring. It is the kind of purity and trustworthiness from which the deepest kinds of passion flow. So, take off your choir robe and go get holy. Chapter 7. Three's a Crowd. Protecting Your Marriage from Intruders Many things compete for your love. You can't assume that the strong connection you had when you first married will always just be there. Other forces can come between you and your mate and diminish your relationship. As a bank guards its money, each spouse must guard and protect the core of the marriage, which is love. Marriage requires several kinds of boundaries to survive. We need to set limits on our individual needs and our desires and our demands. We need to say no to our spouses. And we also need to have boundaries between the marriage and the outside world to preserve what we have. The outside world deeply affects how a marriage operates. The pressures and temptations and even genuinely good opportunities coming from the outside world are really limitless. As stewards of the marriage covenant, you need to know how to structure your relationship so that the outside doesn't control what is inside. Here are some intruders that can weaken the marital bond. Work, kids, outside hobbies and interests, TV, in-laws, church, internet, financial involvement, friends, addictions, and even affairs. Most of these items aren't bad in and of themselves, yet when they come in between a couple's love, they can be destructive. You will need to work to protect your marriage. And before we talk in more detail about these intruders, we need to discuss what drives the problem of intruders in the first place. A marriage is only as strong as what it costs to protect it. In other words, you value what you invest in. If you've spent time and effort and sacrifice in preserving your marriage from other influences, your odds of a solid marriage are much better. If life has just happened to your marriage, you will have a more fragile bond. Like the man who sold all he had for the pearl of great price in Matthew 13, verses 45 and 46, those who value the preciousness of their marriage will pay a high price to preserve it. Marriage is an exclusive club. It's a two-person arrangement, leaving out all other parties. And this is why wedding vows often include the phrase, forsaking all others. Marriage is meant to be a safe place for one's soul. Third parties can become disruptive to this safety. Our love often gets segmented into other places. This problem, which is called triangulation, is one of the great enemies of good marriages. Triangulation occurs when one spouse brings in a third party for an unhealthy reason. A triangle is created when, for example, a wife, who is person A, goes to her friend, which is person C, for something that she should go to her husband, person B, for. Or in a family setting, a sibling, person A, calls you, person C, to talk about mom's problem without first talking to mom person B. In triangulation, a spouse takes a part of his heart away from his mate and brings it to an outside source. This is not only painful, but also unjust. It works against what God intended to develop in marriage, the mysterious unity that brings the couple closer to each other in ever-deepening ways. Triangulation betrays trust and fractures the union. This is why God is so adamant about honest, direct relationships. He hates the deception and indirectness of triangulation. Gossip, for example, is a form of triangulation. If you happen to be person C, the one in the middle of the two spouses, you may think you're helping the couple. In truth, we all do need people to confide in. But if you're involved in two people moving further apart, you're being destructive in spite of your good intentions. You may need to tell the person coming to you, Kathleen, these are hurtful problems between you and Dan. I feel for your struggle. I want to support you. But until you're going to him first with these issues, I feel I'm a party to gossip and deception. W will you talk to him about it and then let me know how I can help? Married love requires a great deal of safety for intimacy to grow. 
Marriage brings out the most vulnerable and fragile parts of us, and these vulnerable parts need a warm, grace-filled, and secure environment in which to grow. If a third party threatens this, those fragile parts cannot be safe enough to emerge, to connect, and to develop. A wife who has trouble learning to trust others, for example, will have great difficulty investing in her husband if he is kinder to other people than to her, or if he discusses with friends what she shares in private with him. In addition, marriage is designed to mature us. Living in such close proximity for so long with another person helps us come out of our isolation and self-centeredness. But it takes a great deal of work to grow in this context. You can be real with your colleagues and friends, but if you want to get the scoop on what someone's really like, the first person to ask is the spouse. The very exclusivity of marriage is like an oven. There's a lot of heat, and you can't always escape when you'd like to. But this heat can help us grow also. The heat, or the pressure of living so closely with someone else, can help us face our weaknesses and work on them. Most of us would like to avoid having to say no in life. It's work, it causes anxiety, and it can upset people. Yet reality dictates that to say yes to keeping a close marriage, you will have to say no to lots of other things. A life of yes to everything else ultimately results in a no to your marriage. You simply do not have the time and resources and energy to do everything you want to do. Couples need to normalize the discipline of forsaking and make it part of everyday life. For example, I need to check this out with my spouse. Or, no, we need to spend some time together are two of the best things any married person can say to protect his or her union from intruders. All intruder problems are ultimately caused by either adding the wrong thing, such as inappropriate people or bad influences, to the marriage, subtracting the good, which is closeness and honesty, from the marriage, or both. When we address the idea of keeping out intruders, we're not saying that marriage is a self-contained unit in which each spouse meets every emotional need of the other. Marriage was not designed to be the source of all life for us. The marriage bond is one of God's many avenues of sustenance for us, along with His own love in the Bible and relationships in the church. All good marriages need outside support, so we need to seek out the right and appropriate sources. These should be people who are not only safe, but whose influence on us strengthens the marriage bond. Find people who are for your marriage and want to help you grow together, and avoid those who play the game of poor you being married to that bad person. This doesn't help a marriage. And even further, avoid those who would like to be destructive to the bond in the guise of being helpful to you. So many affairs begin with this scenario. Often, the intruder really isn't the issue. The intruder is the result or the symptom of another issue in marriage. The real issue has more to do with your relationship or your character. Sometimes, something is broken in the connection. A related issue in allowing intruders into a marriage occurs when one or both partners are unaware of the fragility of marriage. They often adopt the mentality that no crises are going on, so everything must be okay. And they will tend to the crises or the squeaky wheels of work, parenting, church, and friends. The couple may also feel positively toward each other and so just assume that they're doing okay. Well, this is an immature perspective on the institution of marriage. It's a little like how a young child feels toward her parents. She's secure and confident in the sense that they will always be there no matter what she does and they'll always be available when she returns to them for help and love. This is right for a young child to feel. But for marriage partners, it can be a problem. Marriages can go a long time before the influence of intruders is felt. If both spouses are active and structured people, they may shift away without a discernible blip from a deep connection between each other into a comfortably numb one. They may wake up one day feeling that they aren't inside each other's hearts and that other things own their hearts. The saddest cases are those in which the partners become aware of this and think, it's not that bad as is. Let's just keep things this way. The reality is that marriage is only as good as the investment people make in it. God has constructed life so that we're always either going forward into the growth process or backing away from it. We can't stay the same, and marriage reflects this reality. The connection either deepens, opening up both spouses to the hearts of each, or it starts to deteriorate, closing them off from each other. Chapter 8, Six Kinds of Conflict 
Conflict is not all the same. The rules are different for different kinds of conflict. In this part of the tape, we want to help you distinguish what kinds of conflict you are having. Then you might be better equipped to find a solution acceptable to both of you and to the relationship as well. Let's look at common marital conflicts and then examine each kind. Conflict number one, the sin of one spouse. In this simple scenario, there's a culprit. Someone has done something wrong. One spouse has sinned against the other. There is a true infraction, not an imagined one, and there is no shortage of areas in which we can sin. Sexual sin, angry outbursts, loss of self-control, impatience, critical attitudes, judgmentalism, out-of-control spending of the family money, which is thievery, lying or deception, critical attitudes, substance abuse, controlling behavior, emotionally injurious behavior like name-calling or belittling, misuse of power, pride, selfishness, greed, jealousy, envy, and conceit. Told you the list was long. The first thing to consider in facing the conflict that comes from an individual sin is the attitude of the spouse confronting the sin. Even the best people can do what the Bible calls, quote, falling short of the grace of God. The best thing that anyone can do in the face of the sin of a spouse is to demonstrate the same attitude God has towards someone who sins. At the same time, don't minimize the sin. This is one of the most difficult things for some people to grasp. These people feel that if they're going to be full of grace and humble, they can't be tough on the sin. But as a friend of mine once said, go soft on the person and hard on the issue. Conflict number two, immaturity or brokenness of one of the partners. All of us will fall short of the demands of life. This is a difficult concept, though, for some people to understand. Most people get married totally unaware of their spouse's shortcomings. In fact, part of, quote, falling in love is idealizing an imperfect person, not even seeing where he or she falls short of that ideal. But in every relationship, reality eventually surfaces. And when it does, it is very important to face it. Accept reality about yourself and your spouse. Communicate your support to your spouse. Face issues as real problems. Own your problems. Get a plan. And finally, make it mutual. Guard against labeling one spouse as, quote, the problem person. This is never true. Conflict number three, hurt feelings that are no one's fault. This is a familiar pattern in many relationships. One person feels hurt. The hurt person communicates as if the other has sinned against him. The accused party gets defensive, and they go to court defending their innocence. Then the couple ends up alienated. The problem never gets resolved, and they go on, forgetting about it the next day. This is common. Because we all have hurts and things to which we are sensitive, innocent things will set us off. What is important is that we learn how to deal with this kind of hurt where no one is really wrong. Here are some hints. When you are hurt, acknowledge it to yourself. Tell your spouse you're hurt by something she did. Communicate that you know it is your problem, that you just want your spouse to understand. Then the other has to empathize. If you are on the other end of the hurt, show empathy for your spouse's feelings. Know that by caring and offering empathy, you are not saying that it is your fault. Identify patterns and plan. Learn what hurts you. Then you can anticipate things that might hurt you in the future. And when it happens, you can take precautions to respond helpfully or better yet, avoid the hurt altogether. Conflict number four, conflicting desires. Wherever you have two people, you will have conflicting desires. It is one of the things that makes a relationship what it is. Normally, two giving people develop a pattern of give and take, and differences get negotiated. But sometimes they hit a stalemate. A few principles can help. First, avoid moralizing your preference. Make sure you realize that your desire is not a higher one than your spouse's. Do not try to win by making yours right and your spouse's wrong. These are preferences, not laws. Next, empathize with and understand the importance of your spouse's desires. Avoid devaluing what your spouse wants. Stay away from statements that make it sound as if what she wants is less important than what you want. Her desires are just as real to her as yours are to you. Validate her desires as real and good. You may think that movie is cheesy, but she really likes it. Move to meet your spouse's desires before you meet your own. If you're trying to make sure that your mate gets what he or she wants first, your arguments will be over who gets to give that day, 
not who gets his or her own way. If necessary, keep an account of yours, mine, and ours. This system is valuable for couples with differing personalities who drift into unconscious patterns. If you keep an account, you will guard against the passive spouse becoming the perpetual loser. The more assertive one will finally get some limits. By keeping score, who got to choose the movie the last time, you will know whose turn it is this time, instead of just relying on your own personality patterns to make it fair. Don't define an I choice as a we choice. Some spouses who enjoy togetherness define what they want as being for the relationship, when in reality it's for themselves. Some people feel cheated when the other spouse wants to do something by himself or herself. They feel as if they always give to the relationship and as if the other person is being selfish. This is not true. They are not giving to the relationship. They are making personal choices that include the other person because they don't like doing things alone or apart from the relationship. Conflict number five. Desires of one versus the needs of the relationship. The rule here is that there is no rule. If there were a rule, it would be to find balance over the long term. No relationship is going to survive if all the members are not getting some desires of their own met. Vice versa, no relationship is going to thrive if the members get their individual needs met and the relationship always suffers. It is good for a relationship at times to serve its members. Conflict number six, the known versus the unknown problems. Denial has received a bad rap. To be sure, it can be dangerous. When we are in denial about some problem, it can destroy us. And some denial systems are very strategic and intentional. People with substance problems, for example, maneuver a lot to remain unaware of their problem. This kind of denial needs to be assaulted. But another kind of denial is not intentional. It is the human trait of being unaware. Some people are not, quote, in denial because they have a blind spot. We all have aspects to our personalities and character that we do not know about. In marriage, your spouse may know more about you than you do. The trick to growth is becoming partner to this secret knowledge. Develop attitudes between the two of you where you can talk about traits that one has and doesn't know about in a kind, loving, and accepting but honest way. Chapter 9, Resolving Conflict with a Boundary-Loving Spouse in any situation requiring change, two major issues appear right off the bat. Number one, the issue to be dealt with, and number two, the ability of the person to deal with the issue. If number two is good, then in most cases, number one will not be a problem. With some couples, category number two is a bigger problem than category number one. They are not open to feedback, they can't see when they are wrong, they don't like limits of any kind, and they blame everyone else but themselves for their problems. These people we call boundary-resistant and we will cover them in the next part of the tape. But people who have the ability to hear feedback and listen, we call boundary lovers. In the history of people helping, from biblical times until now, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who listen to feedback and those who don't. Modern psychiatry calls the ones who don't listen to feedback and cannot observe their problems, quote, character disorders. Many times, professionals do not expect a lot of change from such people. We disagree. We have seen lots of change in initially resistant people. The other ones, the ones who listen to feedback, the ones we call boundary lovers, are characterized by several traits. They are open to feedback and correction from others and gain understanding as a result of confrontation or feedback. They don't become defensive when their spouse shares feedback. They take ownership of their problems, choices, feelings, attitudes, and behaviors. They have the ability to see themselves and observe their behavior. They value the treasures of their spouse. They see their spouse as an individual separate from themselves with separate experiences. They allow their spouse the freedom to be different from them. They respect the freedom and space of their spouse. They see their own need for growth and change. All of these traits show that someone is open to the truth, to the freedom of the other, to responsibility, and to love. It might be good to take a look at these traits with each other and see where you are. Everyone needs improvement, and you are probably not perfect in all of them. But if you do have an attitude of openness, an ability to see your own problems, a desire for your spouse and you to experience freedom and love, then you will be able to talk through problems and help each other. If you are both boundary lovers, then you only have one problem when you have a conflict instead of two. 
This is very good news indeed. The other piece of good news is that having the first problem is not bad either. Conflict is normal. If you didn't have conflict, one of you would be unnecessary in the relationship. Wherever two or more are gathered, there will be conflict. But this is not bad. Conflict just means that two things come together that are opposed to one another and do not immediately agree. The fun part's working it through. Previously, we discussed the six different kinds of conflicts. There is a pattern to what we have suggested, a process for dealing with conflicts of all kinds. It involves the character traits and the interventions we have discussed throughout the book. For all kinds of conflicts, the Bible suggests the following predictable path over and over again. Observation. You can't fix a problem you do not see. Confrontation. You cannot fix a problem that you don't talk about. Ownership, grief, and apology. If you are the problem, or at least part of it, own it. If you've been hurt, own your hurt and communicate it. If you are the one who is doing the hurting, then confess and apologize. If you are the wounded party, forgive as well as express your hurt. And then repentance. Once you see your part in something, repent and commit to change. Problems do not go away immediately. Become involved in whatever process will be necessary for change. It may be counseling or some other form of structured help, but commit to it and stay involved. Have some system of reexamination. Just because you have faced something does not mean it is gone forever. Get a checkup from those to whom you have made yourself accountable, and then continue to get reexamined for other things as well. If you have a boundary-loving spouse and are one yourself, you are fortunate indeed. It means that you are open to the truth, responsibility, freedom, and love. And if both of you are open to such things, God will help you find them. Keep it up. Chapter 10. Resolving Conflict with a Boundary-Resistant Spouse Boundaries aren't always welcome in a marriage, but that's not how God intended it. God designed boundaries for some very good reasons, all of which benefit a couple. Boundaries protect love. They enhance freedom. They allow people to be separate and still stay connected. They define responsibility so that people know what their tasks are. It's a wonderful thing when a couple enters the process of boundary building as a team. This is the ideal. Boundaries operate best when both spouses restrict their freedoms so as to better love each other. Because you love your spouse and want to enhance his life and growth, you restrain your tendencies to be selfish, and you even curb your right to exercise legitimate freedom sometimes. You don't want to use your freedom to hurt the one you love, and this is the essence of responding to your mate's boundaries. Love can only flourish and deepen when two people embrace the pain of receiving and respecting their mate's boundaries. It is the nature of love itself. When it's freely given to your spouse, it blesses the giver even more than the receiver. So many good things result when both mates preserve the boundaries of the other. Yet, sometimes a spouse does not see the benefits of this gift from God. People who control others or who don't take ownership of their own lives don't experience freedom and good news when they hear the boundary message. In fact, controlling spouses hear that they're hurting someone they love. They hear that things need to change, and change is difficult and often painful. So it's understandable that any spouse would experience receiving boundaries as unpleasant. Accepting boundaries hurts sometimes. It's realistic to identify pain as pain, even if it is growth-producing pain. The painful discipline of boundaries will eventually bear good results in our lives. As God says in Hebrews 12, verse 11, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And we believe that boundaries are the only way to keep love alive. The issue is different, however, when a mate goes beyond saying, Ouch! I don't like this! to, I won't accept this! in response to an appropriate limit. This is not a reaction to pain. This is a value statement. It says much about the character of the spouse. Good character welcomes the pain of boundaries as a person of character wants to love God and others and grow spiritually and emotionally. A person of problem character, however, refuses to accept his status as someone who sometimes needs correction and limits from others. Yet there really are many mixed marriages, mixed in terms of the spouse's view of boundaries. It is sad when one spouse finds the other is not willing to carry his load. 
During all the times I've spoken on boundaries over the years, the scenario that fills my heart with joy is the one in which a couple comes up to say hello and says, We're here today because we both want better boundaries. They are united in love and truth and the pursuit of God's growth. The opposite scenario that wrings my heart is the one in which a married person attends alone, saying, He isn't interested in boundaries or she won't respect my boundaries. In these and many more settings, two factors are prominent. First, one spouse has too much responsibility and the other has too little. And second, the boundary-busting spouse is refusing to make the right changes. People who don't respect others' boundaries have a basic attitude toward life. I should be able to do what I want. The boundary-resistant spouse may be a wonderful and loving person in normal circumstances. The couple may be genuinely drawn to each other and care deeply for one another until a boundary issue arises. Then, the good feelings go away, and anger, guilt messages, or acting out take their place. The boundary-resistant spouse reacts this way because he really does feel that the limit, any limit, is unreasonable, unfair, and hurtful. So he is enraged that his mate would be so mean as to say no to him in some area of life. Her request for him to respect her no feels like hate, not righteousness. It's normal to be angry when someone treats us unfairly, but it is immature to be angry when our spouse sets a limit with us for a legitimate reason. Your spouse may be crossing boundaries with you out of a lack of awareness. You may not know if this is the reason for the problem. Approach the problem first as if it is an ignorance issue. You'll find out quickly enough whether or not you are right. If you're correct and he's truly crossed boundaries, either your spouse will love you for telling him and will make the changes, or he will resist it. And this resistance is the bigger problem. Be aware that discovering that your spouse is a boundary buster doesn't mean he's any worse a person than you are. The acting out, childish, immature, or controlling spouse does have a more obvious problem. As his issues are more exposed, he can look very bad to others while you look very innocent. This reality has its dangers. Beware of judging and condemning as you figure all this out. Be merciful in how you think about your spouse. Most of the time, the mate of a boundary-resistant spouse has much to repent of also. You can see why you have to carve out time to work on setting boundaries, as it takes so much time to deal first with ourselves. To accept boundaries, a person must be able to see the effects of his lack of boundaries on others. Love based on empathy is one of the highest and purest motives to change. It is truly treating others as you would like to be treated. However, some people have difficulty becoming aware of their effect on people. They have trouble sensing emotionally that they can hurt others. This is a problem in compassion. They may do all the right things, but they can't sense the feelings of others. Often, people who struggle with understanding feelings tend to be detached and self-absorbed. Opening up the world of emotions and relationships to this spouse may be very helpful. He may need to have emotions explained to him so that he sees the feelings under people's skin. Some spouses have a low sense of ownership of their actions. They feel that they should be able to do whatever they want and suffer no consequences for it. Like a small child, they aren't anxious about crossing others' boundaries because they don't see their life as their own problem. It is someone else's. None of us takes responsibility for our own lives gracefully. It has to be built into us by many painful experiences. And some people have escaped this lesson because parents and friends have enabled their behavior and rescued them. Behind an irresponsible spouse is always a safety net person, either in the past or the present. Let's suppose your spouse is aware of your feelings and concerns, but still ignores or minimizes or otherwise resists your boundaries. If this is your situation, you have some work ahead of you. It is hard work but it can also be the most productive thing you will ever do for your marriage. In this section, we want to give you a structure to follow to help deal with your resistant spouse problem in a caring yet truthful manner. You must not approach this problem as if you are a team. At this point, you really have an adversary, so don't expect much cooperation from your spouse. A few things you may be tempted to do will not help the situation at all. Remember these and take these in your wallet and don't do them. 
Don't deny or minimize the situation if it is a significant boundary problem. Hiding from reality does not change reality. Don't ignore the situation hoping it will get better. Time alone does not heal character immaturity. Don't become more compliant and pleasing hoping love will fix everything. Again, character issues demand more than love in order to mature. Don't nag. Repeating the same protest over and over never changed anyone. Don't be constantly surprised at your spouse's behavior. This is the sign of a defensive hoping against hope. Expect things to stay the same until you initiate changes within the marriage. Don't blame. Very few marriage boundary conflicts involve an all-innocent and all-guilty party. Take ownership of your part of the issue. But don't take total ownership of the problem. If you rescue your partner from his part, you will only make the issue worse. Here is a structure of some things to do. Make soul connections. Get relationships that sustain you through these periods. Grow and own. Grow in your own spiritual growth experience and own the part of the problem that you contribute. Identify the specific issue. Make it about an issue, not about everything about them as a person. Validate your spouse. Let them know that you understand their feelings, that their feelings are real, even if you disagree, and that you care about them. Love your spouse. Love the way that God sees it is to be for someone's growth. Let them know it and be loving. Create a level playing field. In other words, you have to earn the right to require your spouse to change. Let them know what you've done that was a problem. Ask forgiveness. Request change. Let them know and be clear about what the problem is and what you want to change so they're not confused or in the dark about it. Give your spouse time and patience. We all need time and patience to grow. Don't expect a 180 change overnight. Establish appropriate consequences. Let your spouse know that you want change and you hope the change will happen, but there's some things you will do so as to protect yourself and not to rescue them that are appropriate to the situation. Warn your spouse. Everybody needs warning. Remember to let them know that things will happen in advance so they won't be blindsided by your actions. Follow through. A boundary without a consequence is nagging. Make sure you do more than set a limit. Follow through with your consequence. Observe and evaluate over time. Adjust your boundaries and your consequences as your relationship changes. If your spouse begins to change and mature, make them smaller. If your spouse escalates, you may need to make the boundaries and consequences more severe. Deal with escalation and anger. Don't be surprised if a spouse that has never heard the word no has a tantrum in some form. Be ready for it, normalize it, be patient with it, but hold the boundary. Normalize your own doubt. Don't be surprised if you start questioning yourself. This is a new way of living for you. Be sure you're around people who can reassure your doubts. Leaving permanently. It's sad but necessary to bring up the ultimate consequence in marriage, which is divorce. Divorce doesn't repair a marriage, it ends it. It's much less than God's ideal, but it's allowed in certain circumstances, such as adultery or desertion by an unbelieving spouse, Matthew 5 and 1 Corinthians 7. Even then, God never mandates divorce. There are many steps to take before you consider divorce, as you can see from this chapter. Divorce can only be the last step in a long process that includes prayer, invitation, change, patience, consequences, and love. Hopefully the above structure will help you know how to approach boundary setting with a resistant spouse. There are some difficult realities about setting boundaries with a spouse who doesn't support boundaries. Yet, remember that God supports you as you follow His ways. He will not leave you during the conflicts and dark times. Cling to him and your friends as you establish good limits for you and your marriage. As Psalm 42, verse 8 teaches us, By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me. Remember his love as you begin the boundary-setting process in your marriage. But before you begin that process, listen to the next part of the tape to avoid the mistakes some have made in setting boundaries.
Chapter 11, Misunderstanding Boundaries in Marriage I had a curious experience while speaking on boundaries at a seminar one day. During a question and answer segment, a woman said, I'm so glad I learned about boundaries. I was able to break free from an abusive relationship. You could see the approving nods in the audience as they affirmed the prisoner who was now out of jail. Later that same day, a man came up to me and said, I know that I've been a controlling husband, but for a long time I've been working hard on my issues, going to counseling, joining an accountability group, meeting with my pastor. That woman who mentioned breaking free from an abusive relationship is my wife. Because of these boundary ideas, she's left our home and our kids, and she refuses to meet with our pastor to deal with these problems. I wondered about how easily the audience would have bestowed their approval on this woman had they seen the distress on her husband's face. Over the years, we've become concerned about similar misunderstandings about boundaries within the marriage relationship. Our concerns generally stem from one spouse misusing the role of boundaries in the marriage. Misuse of boundaries often results in increased alienation instead of increased love. Here's some examples. A wife whose first and only boundary is to divorce her husband. A husband who controls his wife but calls his actions setting boundaries. A wife who uses consequences and withdrawal to get revenge on her husband. A husband who excuses his rage attacks by saying he's simply being truthful. These are all grievous misunderstandings of what the Bible teaches about becoming a righteous, responsible, free person, a person with good boundaries. Boundaries were not designed to end relationships, but to preserve and deepen them. And with couples, boundaries are ultimately for working within the marriage, not outside of it. The purpose of this chapter is to clarify some of these misconceptions about boundaries in marriage. We will look at the purpose of suffering, how boundaries fit into problem-solving in marriage, and the divorce question, as well as the issue of submission. There is a problem in thinking that setting boundaries means we don't have to suffer. It's like thinking that when we say no, we can now do whatever we want. Actually, nothing can be further from the truth. Boundaries are not about an escape from suffering, nor an escape from responsibility. In fact, when we set limits in marriage, sometimes we suffer more and not less. When a wife takes a stand to disagree with her opinionated husband's desire to plan their weekend his way, she will probably suffer for her stand. Yet, it may be the right thing for both of them. Suffering is a necessary part of life growth in any meaningful relationship. No truly mature person or marriage has ever escaped suffering. In fact, the Bible teaches that suffering produces perseverance, which then produces character. Suffering at least the kind that God calls us to experience, is designed to help us adapt to reality the way it really is. Through godly suffering, we learn to get our needs met and give to others and yet relinquish demands that all creatures in the universe bow down to us. Godly suffering helps us survive and even thrive while giving up the wish to be God. In fact, few strengths that bind and deepen a marriage involve no pain and no discomfort. Godly suffering gets us into the learning curve of adulthood. However, the confusion about suffering and boundaries in marriage often comes not because spouses try to get out of growing up, but because they have been suffering for some time for the wrong reasons. Godly suffering described above is good for us, but ungodly suffering is not. Let's look closely at ungodly suffering to understand it. Ungodly suffering comes from either doing the wrong thing or not doing the right thing. This type of pain is a signal to us that something bad is happening. It's a warning to change a behavior, an attitude, or a feeling. Do not misunderstand what is going on here. The rescuing spouse of the rageaholic is not experiencing godly suffering, the kind that comes from doing the right thing. Instead, she is experiencing ungodly suffering, the kind that comes from doing the wrong thing. She is reaping what she is sowing. It is to be hoped that she will heed the warning of this pain and change her ways. Ungodly suffering should resolve itself when we stop doing whatever caused it. God does not want you to set boundaries in your marriage to end suffering and pain. He wants you to end the ungodly suffering, which produces no growth, and enter His suffering, which always brings good results. 
When God wants to help us grow, He uses His boundaries as one of several elements to encourage us to change and mature and become what He intended us to be. The process of growth is difficult, but the alternative, divorce, is worse. But before we talk about divorce, let's take a quick look at how the idea of submission in marriage has been misused. As Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 25 tell us, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Few passages in the Bible have been subject to more misunderstanding and misuse than Paul's teaching on submission. Husbands have used it to justify control and abuse of their wives. In fact, we have rarely seen a client in marriage therapy bring up submission unless a big part of the problem is a controlling husband. Usually, a husband wants to control and not to serve his wife, and he is in denial of his own controlling behavior. When his wife has finally had enough and stands up to him, he plays the submission card as a way of getting back in control and avoiding whatever problem she is confronting. This is not what this passage has in mind. Basically, this passage establishes a sense of order in a marriage. It places final responsibility for the family on the shoulders of the husband. He is the head or the leader of the family as Christ is the leader of the church. The passage asks the wife to submit to her husband's leadership as we all submit to Christ's leadership. What does this leadership look like? It is basically the leadership Christ provides the church. He died for her and makes her whole. He looks out for her growth and best interest, cleanses her from guilt, provides resources for her growth, and protects her from the world, the flesh, and the devil. He encourages her to develop her talents, heals her hurts, takes her suffering on himself, supports her in trials, and comes alongside of her when she falls. A leader is a giving servant. If a woman is not submitting to such a leader, then she is out of step with life itself and certainly with her own well-being. If she does not submit to love, truth, protection, and provision for her needs from a humble man who would die for her? Something's wrong. What submission does not mean is that a husband just tells a wife what to do. Leadership does not mean domination. Marriages that work the best have equal partners with differing roles. Decisions are best made mutually, as both parties with their different strengths bring in different perspectives. A loving man would never make some decision that would hurt his wife. He needs her input, and she needs his. They are mutually interdependent and are partners in the marriage. In fact, in the verse before the submission verse, Paul says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The husband should always submit to his wife's needs as Christ did for ours, even to death on a cross. There is also the problem of a controlling woman who wants to be in charge of everything. Selfishness knows no gender lines. If a man is so passive and wimpy that a controlling wife is able to take charge of him for 50 years, something's wrong. The idea of submission is never meant to allow someone to overstep another's boundaries. Submission only has meaning in the context of boundaries, for boundaries promote self-control and freedom. If a wife is not free and in control of herself, she's not submitting anyway. She is a slave, subject to a slave driver, and she is out of the will of God. A free person is the only one who can submit. Now, let's consider the divorce. Divorce is not a boundary in a relationship. Divorce is an end to a relationship. Often people will get to a point in a boundaryless marriage when they just cannot take it anymore, and they're right. God never meant any relationship to be lived without boundaries, for boundaries enforce His righteous principles. But God never meant for divorce to be the boundary either, and He certainly did not mean for it to be the first real stand that someone takes. God's solution for I can't live that way anymore is basically good. Don't live that way anymore. Set firm limits against evil behavior that are designed to promote change and redemption. Get the love and support you need from other places to take the kind of stance that I do to help redeem relationship. Suffer long, but suffer in the right way. And when done God's way, chances are much better for redemption. We wrote this book and tape to help you avoid ungodly suffering. Even if your spouse is not growing and maturing, if you take the stances we suggest here, you can be healthy. 
We've seen many situations turn around when people stop ineffective behaviors, nagging and people-pleasing and angry leaving, and take a firm stance over a process of time. There are many, many unnecessary divorces. God has always intended that we do everything we can to redeem relationships and not to leave them. In one sense, people with real boundaries could avoid many divorces. But they might have to take a strong stance, separate, not participate, and demand righteousness before participating again. If they become the light, then the other person either changes or goes away. And that is why we say you really should not have to be the one who divorces. If you're doing the right things and the other person is truly evil, he most likely will leave you. But you've done everything possible to redeem the relationship. Boundaries in a marriage seek to change and redeem the relationship. Divorce should never be the first boundary. You need to set boundaries in the context of relationship, not for the purpose of ending relationship. Take a stance that you will not participate in the relationship until the destruction ends. This is a boundary that helps. But if you take that stance, make sure the problem is truly the other person's and that you have followed all of God's steps. Obviously, by writing this book, we want ungodly suffering in a relationship to end. But we also want redemption to happen. End your suffering and see if the boundaries you set to end your suffering can be used to bring about redemption and reconciliation as well. We have seen it happen many times in many hopeless situations. When one spouse finally gets true boundaries, the other turns around. Give it a chance. You've been listening to Boundaries in Marriage by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend, read by the authors. Produced and directed by Jeff Bowden for Zondervan New Media. Abridged by Steve Womack. Recorded at Audio Vision Studios, Tustin, California. Recording engineer, Bill Truesdale. Mixing and mastering at Zondervan Studios, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Remastering to CD in 2006 by Brad Hill. Recording copyright 1998 by Zondervan. Based on the book Boundaries in Marriage. Copyright 1998 by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. All rights reserved. Unauthorized duplication is prohibited by law. This Zondervan Audio Pages condensed production is available in a complete printed book edition at your local bookstore. For a complete listing of all Zondervan Audio products, please visit zondervan.com.